no corners, no distractions. Are you all for us? Is the UI that you're proposing? No. For the color in The thing is, it's a UI that most other people propose. <laughs> I, I really want to do this now. They forced me to talk about you. Well, um, hello. Yeah. We're about to start. Tudor is going to talk about something very interesting. Um, so, who is Tudor? <laughs> he is Tudor. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, uh, seriously, I think uh, he's one of the guys that has one of the most interesting ideas, one of the most interesting ideas about how to develop software. And it's very interesting to see what he thinks, um, you know, uh, as a new option and as an open mind idea. Um, so thank you very much to, for being here. Thank you for the invitation. It's, uh, I've been here seven years ago. And I was, uh, I was arrived, it was really interesting. I'm very happy to be here because we're going to show a new kind of tools. And then that's tools that I want to talk about. Now, tools that I want to show you, but it's not necessarily the tools that I want to talk about. So, you see, anybody knows what this is here? Yes. Right. This was a set of tools that changed people's minds. It changed the way we approach, the way we can think about software. Now the thing is, if you look at, for example, small talk systems, they are not very far away from that picture. Nothing fundamentally has changed with respect to that picture. Now that picture was 40 years, it's for now 40 years old. More, no, 30 years old, 30 something, 35 years old. Um, and the question is, can we not do, can we not leap again? Just like how that picture leaped at its time, how do we leap now from, from that picture on to the future? And that's what the talk is about. So we set up a couple of years ago to create a company which is called Fig. And the goal of our company is to reshape the development experience. And what do we mean by the development experience? By development experience, I mean how you feel and think when you actually work with software. It's the whole experience. Now, a lot of that experience is about tools, right? And that's those tools we know that if we have a set of tools, they will highly influence the way we're gonna think about the problems. And so that means it's kind of important for us to think about the nature of the tools that we expose ourselves to. It's not, it's not enough to just think of tools in terms of features. I'm going to show you lots of interesting features probably today. But it's not the features that are the most interesting things. What is interesting is to understand the characteristics of those tools and how they can potentially change the way we think. Okay? So the tools that we're going to talk about is called uh, the Grabber's Toolkit. That's a whole new IDE for uh, Fire up. It's a built in Fire up, and it works for Fire up at the moment. <coughs> and we are now announcing the second alpha version of it. We announced the first alpha version of it in September in uh, ESA. And now we, are, we have uh, worked a little bit more. And uh, what, uh, what, to, what the Glamour's Toolkit is, is uh, perhaps that's not necessarily obvious. Anybody knows what the Glamour's Toolkit project is? Excellent. So you don't know, which means that I can tell you. <laughs> so it's a whole way of thinking of, of the IDE. And when I say a whole way of thinking, it means we have started from an absolutely empty canvas. And everything that is built uh, for the Glamorous Toolkit is not this. This is the very first version of the Glamorous Toolkit, the one that is shipped with Pyro. The one that is shipped with Pyro has had this one interesting idea in there. And that idea was that tools have to be moldable. 
the idea is that, you know, this is just think of some things, right? So when I open the class browser, right, there, there I can see classes, and I can see methods, <coughs> and I can see packages, right? And they have special views. But all other objects have, are only, almost always, treated as a tree, right? The inspector always shows us a tree. I don't, why? Because they said, we thought about it a couple of years ago, and then we said, well, it's kind of a segregation of objects. But some objects are treated preferentially. They have a preferential treatment, they get their own tools, while all other objects are second-class citizens, or second-class objects. And that's not necessarily how it should be. So the, the Glamorous Toolkit Inspector introduced this idea that all objects have to know, can, be, can be different. And it fundamentally changed the way we started to think about objects. It introduced visual uh, thinking inside the navigation, and so at the end, for example, we, when we measure how we work, um, we, we see that we actually write most of our proof, most of our, uh, we, we do most of our work in the inspector. So more than 50% of the time spent in the inspector. That's what we mean when we talk about the experience of development software. It's not the features that come, it's how the behavior changes, if at all. Right? So we had we had the inspector. Then we started to uh, we we applied the same <coughs> principles on search, so we created Spotter, and then we applied the same principles on debuggers, where we can fit debuggers at runtime uh, to fit the, the kind of thing that we're actually debugging. And all of these actually prove the idea that moldability, the idea that the development environment has to mold to the context, is really important. So that's what that's what leads us to uh, to the current state. Of Glamorous Toolkit. So the current state of Glamorous Toolkit is a whole new stack. It has nothing to do with everything that happened in the past, and it kind of looks like this. So we have Sparta, which is a graphical, a vector graphic canvas. And then we have Block, which is a whole implementation of a graphical framework. We have Brick, which is a set of widgets. And we have the Glamorous Toolkit, which is the IDE. Okay? So um, let me show you how this works. So the rest of the talk is going to be a bunch of demos. And um, during these demos, I want you to look at the features, but also just take a little bit of a moment and see why they are there, and what can we do with them. OK, so some, some of the things um, that we're doing, let's say, how do we start? So one of the things is, here's an inspector. So what do we see here? Everything that you see, so right now we are in Faro, and we're showing a window, which is a morph window. This is the, the normal Faro window, basically. But the contents of this window is a complete new world. It has nothing to do with Faro, but with the default Faro. Okay? So everything that you're seeing here is, is a whole new world. Okay. So here we have, um, an inspector open on a file reference. So because it's a, in this case, it's a folder, it means that we can see here, um, we can see directories, right? And I can maybe click on this one. So if I now just select it, nothing happens. But there is a new triangle that appeared over here. So if I click on that triangle, then I can see the preview, which is another inspector. So notice now how navigating, right, does not spawn another window, for example. What window spawning is one of the problems with the small, with the typical small to five D, right? And equally, if I select something else, maybe um, data uh, or uh, another, um, if I select another another directory, then I will see the, the contents of that one. And then equally here, I can have different kinds of presentations. Like here's the print of that. Here's the raw view. Here are the items. So kind of things that we knew from the previous Glamour Studio. Anybody worked with Faro before? Or recently? Yeah, right? Have you have you played with this? Have you ever <coughs> expected a normal file reference? Right? To see right to see the sum of these previews. So the same properties they apply here as well. Okay? Okay. Now right. So let's see a little bit more. So here if I have it's interesting because I now have uh, uh, another another folder over here. Maybe here I'm gonna have um, you know, pictures. And so here now I just 
can slide from left to right. And these are all resizable. So they don't necessarily have to be exactly the same. And that's a picture. So if I double click on that one, I can see preview of it. Great. Questions? Yeah. So why have you thought about, instead of having a list of uh, yeah. windows inspectors, having a tree where you can of course. go back and Right. But the thing is, so what is this list? So the question is, have we thought is that instead of having something like this, which is a list only, which just shows me the last the last navigation path, what about showing the tree? So when I select for example here, I don't replace this thing, but I, I kind of go back and forth and see the other branch. And that is indeed a very interesting proposition. However, the interesting thing here is, to, whenever you're de designing something, there's, design is always about trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And so, the question is, can we make the simple case optim uh, you know, optim uh, optimized? And then we can see about the rest of that. But is this a, is this a problem? Is this a concern? Yes, it is. Absolutely, it okay. is. Is this a problem that we want to solve in the future? Yes, it is. Cool. Well, what, you can, what you're seeing today, by the way, one other thing uh, um, that we are often asked, what you're seeing today is the last commit that, that just happened, I think, 10 minutes ago. Right? This is the snapshot that you can get. Uh, if, you, if you're going to load now the Glamour's Toolkit, you're going to get exactly this demo on your computer. Okay? This is a, with all the bugs um, that, that go with it. So now the other thing to know about this idea of um, the other thing to know about the idea of, uh, uh, of this flow is that um, if, if I have for example, something like this, the, to, to know about this flow is that it captured the context in which I got to this third step. So if I want to find out how did I get here, I simply go to the left. Right? So the preserve, it's a minimum preserving of, <coughs> of causality. Right, which is very useful. So inspection is very interesting when you go that way. But when you find your answer, the question is, how do I act? And then the moment you need to act, you basically have to go back to the cause, uh, sorry, to the to the symptom to figure out uh, the whole the whole picture. Right. So what this is what that solution uh, tries to solve. Okay. But you know, inspectors are, are interesting. But a more interesting is when when we do the same. For example, here in, in um, I can just do the same here. I can just say, let's say I take the this as a file reference. And if I now this is a playground we call it, um, which is similar to a typical workspace, except that it has other properties. One of them is that it's just one with the rest of it. So evaluating something here or clicking on something here is identical, right? Which also means that all clicks are nothing but queries. If this is a query, then this is a query, right? And that's important. I mean, this, so in small talk, we have always been able to just click or, or evaluate, but it's not always treated in the same way at the UI level. So another thing to, 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 to think about, when we are thinking about the IDE, we don't think of it in terms of features of tools. We think of the IDE as a language. <coughs> a language made of operators, uh, which are visual and interactions, uh, that then you can combine while you work with it, like you do with the language. Right, so this is how we think of that. Okay, so <coughs> that's one. Now another thing uh, to, that we could possibly do is we might want to write here, so this is a, a playground to start going. But you might also equally well maybe say, I just want to write here something. So now here we have self, and self is bound. Um, so then you know, you maybe say, give me the directories, and then you will get those directories. Right? So, so what's the, the cursor at the end? Is it not true? That's interesting. So what's that little dot over here? Mm -hmm. right? And now, here's the thing. right? So the reason, the question, why did we build a whole new graphical stack? Well, we built it because we found that what we can express with the existing stacks, and I'm not just referring to the one in Fire or, or in Smallville. I'm referring to graphical stacks in general. What we can express with them is not good enough. And this is one of those examples. 
So what is that? Well, let's say I close this, <coughs> right? But this execution happened once, right? So I don't have to lose the fact that it happened. So that little dot there is actually a button. So if I click on that, it will redo the same thing. It remembers the result, and it gives it to me so that I can reutilize it any time I want. Okay? It's a little tiny thing, but it can have a really, really interesting impact. Okay? Questions? No? Good. Let's go on. Um, well, another, another thing that um, we can do with... Uh, um, so, sorry, it is not a redo button, but uh, uh, something that remembers. It, so when, when we have when I've done something here, let's say one plus two, and I evaluate that three is now stored in the button. Okay, so that's that's how it goes. Does it does it make sense? Right. So, yes. Yeah, another question. Yeah, so that's this one is the same result as if you would have if you would do it here. Right? So if your inspector is there, then your inspector is there. So that's it. It stores the result <coughs> and it will get you that object back. Right? Which is again, it's most cases is going to be very interesting. When is it interesting? Well, sometimes it inter it's interesting when you, let's say, you have a very long computation and you, by mistake, you just do it. It says, ah, I really would have wanted to inspect it. Right? And now, you don't have to care. Because it will be there all the time and you just click on it and then you will get it. How does that thing disappear? It will disappear as soon as you type something because it's an indication that you're no longer interested in that thing. Okay? Okay. But now, in order to do this, Right? That thing there is a button. It just happens to be inserted in the text editor. That's a reasonably big deal. Okay? So, <coughs> good. <coughs> so let's move on a little bit. Now, another thing that we, uh, we found out when, when we played with, uh, with the original Glamorous Toolkit and all the analysis that we built before that, is that visualizations um, are quite important. Visual, that the RIDE is way too dominated by text, and it shouldn't be. Um, so one of the things that we have here in the current one is um, we have something like this. So here I have, I, I'm saying, give me all the directories, and then I will build a little visualization over here. So if I execute that, I'll get a picture. And this is, these are the same, it's the same folder that you saw before. Uh, so now if I click on, on this one, this is a tutorial, it's a picture, so I can click on those. Right. Which is interesting, because now I just took a little script, right, I built a little visualization, then it's there, I got a, a, an object that knows how to represent itself, and then it's immediately clickable, and it's of course draggable and doable. Now maybe any of you have saw raw cells before, right, the visualization engine. So this is not raw cell, uh, but it's similar, uh, let's say, idea, except that it's built in, into the environment. Okay. But now let's take, a, let's take a moment and look at this one, because this is something uh, where small talk should have excelled, uh, and that's data science. Right, so if you look at this, this is a, use case, a typical use case. You get some data, maybe you apply some visualization, and then you look at it, right? So let's take a slightly more elaborate um, script. And notice how now the retrieval of the data is really a little bit more you know, larger. Right now we're going to get through all of those. So let's run this whole thing again. It takes a bit of time. And then it shows us, again, it's a bunch of directories that uh, are all the sources of the Glamorous Toolkit project. Okay? So now, that's, let, let's talk about the script a little bit. So the script here has two parts, right? <clears throat> it's very often that if I want to find out the, you know, I just want to evaluate the first one, I would just do this, and I get the sources, and then I will start typing the next one, and I will do this, and then I get the visualization. But that's a couple of clicks and drags too much. 
And it's, it's annoying because I really have two conceptual things there. These are not, this is not one step. There are two of them. And very often, I, maybe here with the visualization, I will play with it differently. Let's say I'm not interested in, uh, in, in having the sensor here. I'm just interested in playing and seeing the, the whole things as, as squares, for example. Um, but so it, from that perspective, I want to play with the visualization, but I do not want to recompute the data. Usually, recomputing the data is an expensive step, right? So that's why in the playground we have this idea that we introduce snippets. So if I now press here Alt Enter, I have two different snippets. So evaluating this one here, it will just evaluate that thing, and evaluating this one there, will just evaluate the second one. Right? So we just have different kinds of snippets. Now those snippets can be of different types, but we're not going to go into that. Um, so this is the prerequisite of actually also thinking. How can we reconstruct the way we build our programs? And for a very long time, we were dominated by the idea that the program has to be in one single text editor. So why is that? Right? It doesn't necessarily have to be like this. Um, OK, so, so that's, um, and those snippets are available everywhere. So they are available here as well. So anytime you can do, for example, yourself. Um, and then I, I, I can. And spawn another one and do something else. Okay? Now, another thing to, to know is that we want to have live kind of tools. We want to bring all everything that maybe we are familiar with in other places, uh, let's say in the static code project, and bring it also to the, where the live coding happens. By the way, for us, live programming means programming in the presence of instances. So we want to program where the variable, or ideally self, is bound. That's what live programming means for us. That is, we do not want to write code in the code browser, in the static part. Well, we want to write static code, but not in this, where there is no instance. Because that's not live. That's a different kind of programming. So for us, the coding experience should, a lot of it, is, is biased towards the idea that we want to favor the liveliness of it. And the, you know, the, let's say a system browser type of thing is much more interesting for reorganizing code, but not necessarily for creating new things. Okay? So one of the things, for example, that we might want to have is, for example, a rename. So <coughs> here we might want to do it like this. Obviously, this doesn't exist. Um, or written like that, then it exists again. Now, what just happened here? Because here I do this, right? Notice how I have multiple cursors. Right? So the text editor actually allows us to have one multiple cursors like that. In fact, at any time I can just click here with all of them, and I will get those multiple cursors. Okay? Um, okay, question so far. Yeah? you increase the font size? <laughs> no, because then you will not see much. No. If, you, if you have multiple cursors, but you are typing. Yeah, you're, you're typing, typing and then you can all of them. All of them. All of them. Yeah, or delete or. But like the remake, okay. Yeah, so. Let's try this. Yeah. Um, and then I, I do it here and then I will delete and say two. Okay. And uh, can you have two cursors on the same line? Sorry? Two cursors on the same line also work, right? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so. Great. Okay, good questions, yeah. So, when you have the snippets, all the local variables are shared with them. Yeah. Okay. So, it behaves like a whole playground, except that you have different widgets where you're basically manipulating things. Okay, good. So this is like a typical, you know, playground inspector. It's not like a large leap there. Still a significant <coughs> thing in terms of usability, let's say. You can resize things. Uh, you have much more fluent kind of typing things. But we didn't really like shake the, the tree uh, that much. So one of the things, you know, what is I in the IDE stand for? Integrate. Integrate. Integrated means 
everything about development. That's what it means. That's the design code. That means every time you leave, the integrated has failed, right? And so Stack Overflow, you know, is a successful tool because most IDEs fail on the eye test, right? So that's one. But the other thing is, integrated has also another thing. Because development is not just developed, because it is built by people that type code. Right? There are all sorts of other humans that, that have an interesting thing to say or to contribute to the system that are not necessarily people that type code, programmers. Their programmers may be in a different way. For example, a manager might do that. Right? And the question is, how could we potentially integrate them into the same experience? And then the question is, in order to integrate, you need to provide some sort of unified experience. And then the question is, what is that? And then we, we ended up with this idea of documents. Well, we didn't end it up, we didn't invent that idea. Uh, we just observed that documents seem to be pervasive, uh, especially in, in, in software development, like people, you have docs, and then you have, anybody who's using Confluence here, or some sort of a wiki, or sending, you know, Word documents by email, or, you know, those kinds of things, right? So yeah, and then we really wanted to focus a lot, and we spent a good largest chunk of the last three years figuring out how do we build a technology that we think, how we think about documents. Um, and then the other thing that we noticed is, a quick question, how many of you love working, uh, writing documentation? <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three, right? But how many of you love reading exciting documentation? Now this is like a disproportionate amount of, of things, like very few people love building documents, and, but most would love to have them if they would be available, right? So there is, it's, there's a clear discrepancy between, you know, uh, supply and demand. And the question is, how can we turn this thing? How can we make people love writing documentation? And in order to do this, we, we, set, we set our goal to say, we want to build an environment where we can build documentation and consume documentation in a much cooler way than in any other place. Right? Because it's not just the writing of the documentation is interesting, it's the question is, where do you consume documentation? Right? Think of it, like, where do you consume a tutorial? It's gonna be in a PDF on a web page. Right? That's basically where it is. And then you will copy paste something from there to your IDE. But if, as soon as you have left, the I has failed. Which means that those things have to happen in the same place. So, that's why we work on this uh, engine, which is called Documenter. And um, yeah, I'm going to show you a little bit about it. <coughs> so here's a, here's a tutorial I showed you before. This is a, a little, um, let's say, we're going to just browse this folder. And in that folder, there is one pillar file. Pillar now is, um, is a markup language, right? It's similar to Markdown, except that it has a different kind of syntax. It's one of the original wiki syntaxes. Um, so here it is. This is a file, which is a pillar uh, is, is a pillar file. And so notice how here I have a header. So and as I type, you know, for example, the site, the, the, the fonts in place are decreased, which is okay. It's interesting. Uh, but there is something interesting that I see over here. There's an annotation here at the bottom that says, something example of something. Let's see what is that. Well, that one will actually bring down uh, an example, an example method. Uh, it brings down an example method which has a piece of code, and then if I execute that piece of code, I will get an example, the, the actual object, which is shown with the live inspector, right? in the document, right? It's not outside the document, it's right in there in the document. Now, what do I mean by this is, because you, you saw before that I can type stuff here, right? I can delete this thing and then font increases or decreases. Well, what happens if I do this? The whole thing disappears and the text remains the same, right? I did not switch, I did not switch the editor 
There is no view, there is no edit mode. It's just a document that I can manipulate with live, and things get inserted into that document as I type. So if you if you put the cursor there, it's a matter of uh, you can decide it. Uh, in this case, I don't. But it's not. So as well, I said, you theoretically, yeah, yeah, you can you save, it. save it. It's an editor. Save it real it's an editor. Okay. You can do with this one. I'll show you with another <coughs> thing how it works. Okay. So and as you execute that one, then you get like this, right? So here's a, a couple of examples of what you can do with Mondrian. In this case, this is a UML diagram, and again, you can just navigate to this one. Or if you want, you can spawn it onto the next page, right? Because and then you can just navigate. So I got an I got a, a document which is the beginning of the conversation that allows me then to dive into any any other parts I want. What I put in that document is completely up to me. Right. It's exactly the same thing that you would do to open a wiki page or uh, any other kind of, you know, maybe a markdown document where you would, that you would then generate a PDF out of and then send it to your manager and describe something. Right. You can now do in the IDE, which also means that the IDE becomes interesting for the non-technical people. Because now you have a, a way to exchange documents. Okay? Question so far. So let's see, what exactly is this? So this one over here is actually a tutorial that describes Mondrian. Mondrian is a visualization engine, and it has a little API. Um, so it kind of looks like this. So we have here an example which says, oh, let's create two nodes. So I have here an empty view. Oh, by the way, there's a triangle here. What is that? I don't know. Let's see. If I click on that, I see a preview of that method that I just found which is another example. And just to, just to see what we mean that this is added live, right? I can anytime add it and then look at it. So here I'm just instantiating Mondrian. I assert something because these examples, they actually act like tests. They're very similar. It's exactly the same thing. So on Friday, uh, Andre Kish will, uh, will give um, a presentation about how we don't do test-driven development. We work uh, through something we call example-driven development. Uh, examples is one of the engines that we created to complement uh, our workflow. And the idea here is, it's like a, if you think of an example as a test that returns the object. Right? And because now we have inspectors that are interesting, now I can have a conversation with my object. So my testing, my testing effort really immediately becomes documentation effort. Right? But zero cost. And I get live things, right? Because they never copy pasted code in this document. This code is always tested by my continuous integration. So I know that this thing works, right? So anyway, so in this tutorial I say, here's, uh, just a second. here are two nodes, right? And in the next one I say, oh, I take the two nodes code that I saw before, and then I, I'm gonna add an edge in between the two. So here's now I, I added the edge. Um, and now I will take the one edge with two nodes, and then I will add the tree layout. And now I will have them lay up in the street. Right? So this is the basic of how you work with this. And then you can go on. Here's how you change the different kind of uh, layouts. You can add more of them. And then various kinds of different kinds of situations. But the point here is that this is a whole documentation. Um, and in this case, it's actually using the analysis tool in order to reason about um, dependencies in the Glamour Toolkit project itself. Okay. And these are all clickable, right? So if I click on one of those, uh, theoretically, well, it should work. So I just clicked on, the, on this class, and it gets me to which class I was working on. Right? And then, in this case, I can see here the methods, for example, of that class. OK, so <coughs> this is an idea of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of how documentation could look like. But what else can we do with the documentation? Because this was a, like an interesting tutorial, maybe. Um, so here's another kind of thing. So in this case, we have um, we have a tutorial describing example, a small tutorial describing example driven development. Now in this case, we say, okay, so let's see how do we build an example. We build it like this. We have here 
something. And now I say here, I embed another kind of an artifact, which is called changes. I can see here, this is a piece of code. This is the kind of code you can see often when you're, uh, I can mean, enlarge this one if I want to. When you, when you open a book, right, it says, right, about small talk, it says, okay, create this class, and you see the snippet, and then here's the method, and so on. And then you will go there, and then you will maybe copy it, and then you will paste it in the editor, and so on. Right, which is not necessarily very exciting if this is not what you want to do. So if, you, if the goal of the tutorial is to teach you how to create methods, then yes, by all means, go and create those things. But if you just want to understand what's the impact of creating that method, then perhaps it's not necessarily an interesting exercise because it gets you away from the goal of the tutorial, right? So in this case, I want to teach you about what is it to write examples. So what if I just say apply? And I just apply that thing. Because I did not copy this post here, I put there the diff, which are the changes that are already stored by the IDE when I type, right? So if I'm going to edit this, I can see that there are two changes, and these are all the changes that are happening in this environment that would appear. You know, it's too long. So this, I, I worked on this image for too long, and now I have too long, the, the list is too long. Anyway, but the point is that you can have, you just can pick those changes from your history, and you just add them to your tutorial. That's the cost of writing a tutorial. You do not copy paste anything. Right? You just do something you already know it works usually because you're great, the best for them, and then you cherry pick them and put them and assemble them into your documentation. Right? And also here I have that example that I just compiled, so now if I run it, um, I can see it, and I can just go on like this uh, throughout, the, throughout the whole code. Okay? Right? So it's a different way to think about how do we assemble this documentation. So a whole, other, a whole other kind of um, thing is, so when we work with examples, we put these examples into classes. Right? So we have examples classes. Right? We have unary methods, they return an object, and then we can play with it. Sorry, Henry, you had a question before. Yeah, I was going to ask you, that triangle that helps you to, to yeah. see it all. Yeah, I see this one, yeah. Does it only work when the message is sent to self? No, it, it works when we can verify what exactly is it, that one. But in that case, it's this interface specifically designed for understanding examples. Because we want examples to not be very long tests, we want them to be really, really fine grade little objects, and then we'll, we'll see how we can think about I'll come back to this a bit. Okay. Okay? So here's one class. It's called VR Toggles Example. It's one of those classes that actually has a bunch of these uh, examples. Right? So I can see here their examples, and I can now run them. Right, so this I will argue, and this is an icon, and if it was an icon, right, it shows me the icon, this is a square icon, uh, this is an actual toggle element, whatever, and so on. Right, so I can execute them, and I can see the result of them. Okay? So there are many of them over here. And this is where it becomes interesting, because now I have a, a whole interesting class, which in this case is just about uh, testing the toggle buttons. Okay? So we have now to test. And I said, well, how do we trust, take that effort and make it a tutorial for you to, te to teach you how do you build the toggle button? So if you now switch to the comment of that class, right, what do we see? We see a bunch of those examples, and if you run through them, we say, oh, here's a button with an icon. Here's how you then put, instead of an icon, you put a label. Or here's how you put a, a, a label and an icon, or the other way around. And uh, here's how you change the icon as you click on it. Right? So is this cool? Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, is this cool? Yeah. Yes. Would you like to write now documentation doing something like this? Now this is what I mean. Right? We took something that was not liked and we transformed it into something that is actually exciting. When you do this, you, ch you can change people's behavior. That's the goal. That's our goal. When we, this is how we think about the, the designing of the experience of development software. Right? And then when the problem is actually important, then you can marry economics with, with fun. And there is no need to choose between the two. Right? So, question here. Yeah. I don't know if it's the time, but could you tell us about a real experience with a real team? 
uh, taken this approach? Or yeah, there's... of course. <coughs> I can tell you, I, I gave a couple of other talks before, but I can tell you about the experience of our team. We are building a, an extensive system, which is a whole new stack. This is not a trivial thing. It has properties that do not exist in other places. It has a whole experience that does not exist in other places. And we are working like this. So now we can actually take, we can do this exercise if you want. You can ask arbitrary questions about our system, and within a couple of minutes, I'm quite convinced that I can explain to you what that system does, or what that part of the system does, without drawing anything on a whiteboard. That's the exciting thing. We can make systems explainable by default. <coughs> Actually, less cost than not making them like this by, uh, from the beginning. It's the same thing that people have done with tests. We, they, we learned that you know, if you invest in tests, actually you can build testable systems that are more internal, cheaper than if you don't build them testable, which is completely counterproductive, uh, counterintuitive, right? Now, at the same time, what we have learned is that testing does not exercise explainability. Those two things are orthogonal uh, dimensions. Right? So this is what we do. Good question. Yeah, and, and I wanted to know if you build a presentation for a manager, for example, as you said before. We did. Uh, yeah. How do you share? Do you share? Excellent. Can I get to this point in about uh, uh, ten minutes? Yeah. I'm happy. Yes. So, good. other questions? Can we move on? Excellent. So. So here's, for example, when you open the Glamour's toolkit, you get a tour. And that tour is, okay, it tells you something, here's the link, okay, you can click on that one. But this is interesting here. This is actually the map of the dependencies in Glamour's toolkit. Right? These are all the projects in the Glamour's toolkit, with the visualization describing you how that is. So now I can click, for example, on the inspector in this case, and I can see, oh, there are various kinds of, you know, there's a little bit of documentation about it, plus extra links to other places in my in my environment, right? So maybe uh, equally I can maybe click on block, and then from block I maybe go to element, and then from element maybe um, the element is the root of, uh, of everything, um, right? Or maybe we can see here border examples, and then I can go there. So what do you see here, right? It's a completely different way to navigate an image, right? And it's not dissimilar from the idea of a wiki. We've just transformed the whole image into a wiki. Right? And it's an exciting place to be. You definitely do not want to go to step overflow. Okay? So that's, that's the, the, the difference there. Now, the other thing to notice here, just notice this, right? When I opened the tour, there was no header around it. It's just a document opening in a window. Right? A document opening a window that you can scroll from left to bottom, from top to bottom, is something that any human can understand. There's no need for you to know anything about programming. So now the question is how do we get there? I'll come back to this is problem. Um, but, but that's the idea. Right? So we want the IDE to be a player for absolutely everybody. And it has to be it has to integrate everybody around software development. Okay, so we talked a lot about this. Now one of the things that we play with last, right, is the actual coding experience. The creation of the method is something that for us was, we left it at the very end of our whole exercise. We, we originally didn't start to work on the coding experience until one, one month ago. But we have ideas about how but we didn't really work on it. Now, why is this? Because the static part has to come at the end. And it has to be integrated with the live experience. So first you have to create the live experience, and then we see where the static part comes from. It's not the other way around. We didn't want to start from the, from the way we write code. So the tool that we are now playing with, and it's not finished, uh, but just to give you an idea of how do we think about it, is called <coughs> Coder. So Coder is a bunch of little pieces that can be constructed together in different ways. Um, so let's see what I mean by that. So one of it is, uh, is this one. So if I, let's say, inspect an object, I can see it's, it's a small integer. And then there is a meta site, which basically gives me the structure of the class. 
So here I can see multiple of those methods, right? And uh, some of those methods I can I can expand if I want to. I can do it like this. I can do it like this. Okay, this doesn't have an implementation. Um, and now I can work there. I can go and change this class if I want to. I can go type and I can change code. Okay, so that's the that's the the, the interesting thing that we, we get in that. Uh, so the idea is that we do not necessarily have to see one method at a time. That's one thing. The other thing is that we don't want to have we want to have as less modality as possible. In fact, I have shown you no model dialogue so far. Right? There was no something that popped up in order to ask it or something. Um, and that's a that's a design code that, that we are having. Right? And then if you don't want to see it, then you should just simply collapse and it's there. Right? It, should, it should go away. Now similarly, like here if I like click on something, let's say maybe a typical um, a typical use case is to senders or implementers. So if I go maybe set implementers, I just do apple and I can see where they are, right? So this is an integer, um, this is a small integer, and this is um, somewhere else. Right? Okay, like with this. Or I can do I can go here and I do senders. Now, sender is more interesting. The sender is now to tell me where exactly is it, right? So here it is. It says there. Now, what is this? Is this how, how is this being defined? Is this just a piece of text? No, it's not. It's actually uh, this is actually done live, and it's done with a static analysis that actually looks into the ASD, the partial ASD, by looking at that method as your type. I says it is a new syntax highlighter and a new completion engine that is built on top of. Of, of this idea. And, um, um, so now for us, you know, search, right? This we were not just talking about this. The senders is just one kind of search. Right? But then you can possibly want to have multiple kinds of search. And we should not limit ourselves to this idea that if I just lose I have Apple and senders and implementers and references and then I just have these three search. Why would I only have these three searches? I, I might want to have many of them. So for example how is this, uh, let's say, print implemented? So if I now click here, alt click, then I get a method that shows me the implementation of that tab. So the idea here is that we want to build discoverability into our system, such because it's for us it's very important that you have the, you're going to go and you're going to mold your system to a new context. So that means that you need to go and every time you see something that you like, you want to learn from it. That should be just always ideally one click away. Um, so here we go there, right? So I can see, oh, there are these GT views over here, right? So this is a program that I, that I can, you know, look for. So let's just do that. Let's say I want to say a GT view, and I'm interested in the programs of that GT view. So when I now evaluate this, I get the result with a bunch of things, and now each of them will be will be highlighting the view, right? So that's interesting. Now, another thing that we might see here is that sometimes some of these, you know, we can see here view and then we have explicit. Um, and other things are something like view and maybe a list. So a different, bless you, uh, a different kind of, uh, of a view that we want to implement here. So let's say that I'm just interested in all the lists. So I'm going to go here and I'll say end list and then the references of of GD. So now I get a list which is much smaller and just gonna, it's just going to give me those things that are both the uh, annotated pragma in view and those that uh, are uh, referring to list or sending this message list. So now when I expand that, what do I see? I see both of them highlighted. Right. So that's kind of interesting. Now here's another thing that we noticed yesterday. So yesterday, we did a tutorial with uh, newcomers to, to, to Faro, and um, and they like one of the things is I was told them, oh yeah, you can write this annotation, and then magically the inspector will find the uh, the inspector will find um, will discover the presentation and show it to there, right? And then people said, oh, so if I write this kind of an annotation, then I should be able to complete it. So the completion here, right, is not a general completion. It actually only gives you the annotations, right? The only these annotations and nothing else, no other symbols. So again, com the completion engine is itself moldable. 
And uh, on, on Thursday, you write a file that will show the documentation engine, and then you will see how completion actually works in the documentation engine <coughs> to help you complete the different parts there as well. So everything, this idea of moldability is pervasive throughout, um, throughout our world, throughout the whole environment. So now, one of the things we, um, we, we played with, and it's, it's, as I said, like a lot of what we do is based on examples. So we write examples in order to test, and then we also use examples in order to explain. Um, so here's a, one of those kinds of things. So let's see, here's an example. Um, and this example, what does it do? Well, we don't know what it does, so let's run it. Right? Because it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an object, I can, I can look at it, and in this case it happens to be an element, and it, it shows me how the flow, um, how the frame layout works. So now I can see here there are this red, there's a yellow something, and there's a green something, and a red something, right? But I kind of would like to see how, how they fit together. So here, if I now look at this one, I can see now that I have an example embedded right there. Right? So I, I'll come back, I'm coming back to your um, question, Mariano, now. So here, right, I can actually write code, execute it, and then say, oh, what is this? <coughs> right? Or what is that? Oh, that's an empty, that's an empty element, right? And this whole code over here, this is um, a yellow element. Now notice how actually it says here it's a success um, because it tested it. Uh, so it ran all the assertions. In this case, it doesn't have assertions, but it could. Um, so it was, a, it was a success like this. So I can actually start to understand my system or the examples, how, do, how they are built, by really just looking in place while I type in the same experience. Just look at the result. Okay? <coughs> How does that feel like? Hmm? Yeah. Now, let's take this one a step, a tiny step further. Right? Because the idea is that our thesis is because this this whole the, the idea of all the, the whole development experience is so far away, it's like we have not really challenged it for decades. The we think is this, this, this space is completely unexplored. So we are just at the beginning of it. We are not at the end of it. Right? This is just the very first step. Now the question is, can we really leave? Because even here, I mean, it's very cool that we can embed things in things, and so it's, it's already very exciting. But can we go a little step further than that? So let's do this. I will zoom now into this, into this pane, and just zoom into the pane and make it larger. And I will look at the same example but through a different interface. I will just change my view. So what do I have here? It's the same thing. But now I don't have those triangles, I have these little dots. So what happens if I have a dot like that? And it opens it there, right? And then I have another one, which is there. So what happens now if I scroll here? Right? Because now I can see there's a line that goes all the way into the text editor. This by itself is a very interesting property because it means that the line and these things over here, they are in the same tree. They are in the same world. There's no, there are no multiple worlds. There's exactly one world there. So what happens if I now start to scroll? Right? Did you feel something here? <laughs> no, seriously. Well, did you feel it here? I really want you to get a hold, remember that feeling. Because now you know that it exists. You can look at software in different ways, and the way you look at software can change the way you feel. <clears throat> the way you feel is essential to whether or not you can be happy. I want you to remember that. So this thing, whether you're going to use this tool or not, it doesn't really matter at this very moment in time. What matters for me the most is that you now know that it is possible to look at software in a way that makes you feel excited. Right? Even if you're looking at a legacy code, we can change the way people think about software fundamentally. So let's go on to our little example. So here's I have green, right? Let's expand that one a little bit. Um, and then I have red over here. Let's expand that. And then the container, let's expand that. Notice how it figures out the dependencies, right? So now if I scroll like this, it goes like that, which is very cool. So let's make it larger now. 
right? Now I can see it this like this. So this is already very cool, right? But now every one of these is actually an executable piece, right? Which means I can execute that. Right? I can just run them here, and I can see, oh, this is the empty one, and maybe this is the yellow one, and maybe this is the green one, and this is the red one, and this is the container, and this is the result. Okay? That's how you can think about how do you build, how do you construct complicated objects that you have a hard time understanding when you look at the setup of a test case. It completely can change the way you think. Right? And the essence there is that we can draw these lines. And in order to draw those lines, that's why we built the whole graphical stack. Okay? What can we do with them? We don't know yet. Right? But I want you to get excited enough to start playing with it. Because these are not features. These are transformational things that change the way you might potentially feel. Okay, so, questions so far? Yeah. So, uh, let's see. So, uh, usually in a, in a traditional small code environment, everything is contained in the method source code. Yeah. And the changes, when you change anything, right. you change a method. Yeah. So what about changes here? Because you are expanding what you write, the documentation yeah. everywhere. Yeah. So what about the changes? Yeah, the documentation has an explicit link to whatever you're looking there. So we want to do refactoring with the refactor the documentation. And there's no reason why... Okay, but how do you... Are you capturing the changes in the documentation? And yes. Not yet, but there is no reason for why not doing that. That's definitely the direction in which we will go. Because you want yeah. to share your of changes. Course. Right. So coming back to the sharing thing, right? The question is, how do we share this? Yeah. So let's speak. Uh, let's speak this. Uh, let's speak a, a tutorial, like the take the Mondrian thing. And notice how here I have a little button here, and that little button when I play on it, right? This is one of those which does that, right? I say, well, I want to publish it. And I already have a server running here, and I will publish it. And after it works, it tells me, oh, here's a, a URL. So if I go to that URL, and I will paste the URL, and I press enter, then I get a document, right? But that document, right, it's the whole thing, the what I showed in there. But the document is not, it's a static thing, so for example, Google can find it, if you want, or whatever search engine you might have, uh, can find it. But it also has here a link, right, at the, at the top. So if I copy that URL, and I go back to my environment, and then I start saying, oh, I want to search for that thing, I press enter, I get my document. We call this xdocs. These are a doc, an executable document format in which you can ship things that are, can then be played with your ID. Uh, no, that's a that's a file, it's just a regular file. So now the file that you just that you have just seen uh, can be found here, and it's exactly here, this one, and it's just a so it's it's just this one. It has a the pillar file that you have seen. And has a couple of payloads to metadata to describe what it is in there. But it's a file that you can actually send by email, right? So we don't want to uh, we don't want to uh, disrupt people too much. So sending documents by email is still a thing, right? Okay. So I showed a, a, a quite a number of things. So what this alpha thing is, it has uh, about a dozen different projects inside. So it's a whole stack. So on top of the graphical thing. It's a whole stack of things, a whole stack of projects. I just showed you a little bit uh, of the surface of it. But the idea is that once we start building some of these pieces, they start to be combinable in very, very kinds of different ways. Because we really think, this is how we think when we build the ID, we think of it as a language. Right? Of composable operators that are either interaction or visual or a combination of the two. Right? And then afterwards, you want to, we want to allow you to then go to the idea not of having um, not of having um, a, a language specific ID, but of having a system specific ID. That is, when you look at your system, you should see something that is really different than when I look at my system, because those systems they are not the same. The value of those systems come from the context, not from what is common. 
So they should have, they should look different. And do you notice how the way you something looks can really affect the way you feel and then the way you think about the problem. Right? That's why this is a big deal. Now we, we said that one of the things that we want to leap from is not just we don't just want to target the, the people that program, we want to go outside of those boundaries. And that's why we have XDoc. And XDoc is a is a, is a product, so the, the, the format is, is open source. Everything that you have seen, every, everything I've demoed here is open source. And uh, it's under MIT, so anybody can do whatever they want to do. Um, and so the goal of XDoc is to provide uh, a vehicle to simply transmit uh, interesting pieces that afterwards can be executed through the lens of a tool. Okay? So that's the, that's the goal. Of the mix stuff. And together we can start to rethink a whole bunch of different of different use cases around software development. Okay. So I showed you, as I said, I showed you a couple of, of lots of different features. Uh, but it's not the features, they don't really come. The only thing that comes is how we start to feel and think about software. And so our goal is only met if we change the way people behave. And the reason is why, and the question is, why should we change? And one of the questions that I asked yesterday, and I have people asking several thousand people already, is this, how many of you love working with legacy systems? I work in a small group, so. I know, <laughs> right? So a very few of you love it, right? Very few of you lo love that. But this is where you spend most of your time. Right? And programming is supposed to be the coolest job on the planet, but if it's the coolest job on the planet, we cannot be happy for most of the time. Right? What chances do my, my kids have to happen? That's why these things have to change. Well, not just because of my kids, but because of your kids too. Right? And they can change, and that's the interesting thing. So that's the lens that I want you to look at those. Some of those things will look similar to something else, and it's true. But the interesting thing is what happens when you put them all together into a unified idea. And that unified idea has a couple of dimensions. And those dimensions are, first of all, that it has to be moldable. The idea is that software is the most contextual thing that we've ever created as human species. And as a consequence, we cannot give you picking tools. We don't know your exact problems. Because there's no way to know those exact problems. We can know classes of problems. And the only way to actually be effective is to allow you to mold the tools deal with your specific context. Moldability is essential in software development. It's not a secondary thing. We have for a long time thought about, for example, quality of software as being a property of the code itself, which is wrong. Because if you look, if you can look at the same thing in this way or in that way, and I get to completely different kinds of, let's say, productivity out of that effort, it means that it's the shape of the software is essential too. We cannot distinguish between the two. We cannot reason about quality in abstract without the shape. It's impossible. And it's wrong to not consider the shape as being uh, an essential part. The other thing is it must be integrated. Everything about development uh, must be integrated into that, into that environment, into that experience. And that goes beyond just programmers. The other thing is it has to be visual. Text is great, but text is just one shape. We are amazing visual creatures, and we should take advantage of that. Right? And last, not the, the last but not the least, is that it has to be beautiful. Because we should enjoy the cooler job on the planet. Thank you. <laughs>